Uh, thank you, what a lovely introduction. Um, hello. Um, firstly, I have to say, this is my first thing, Monk, and, and uh, I feel like a real imposter given the quality and, and experience of the other speakers, so I'm going to do my best to live up to their, um, their high standard. Um, my background is fundamentally about technology. Um, most of you uh, ought to name all of these. These little suckers are my favourite uh, uh, processors. They are 80 tinies. They have six little pins, um, and getting those to do interesting things um, is, a, is a nerdy hobby of mine, which is why I've got about 40 different IoT devices in my house measuring various different things like temperature and so on. Um, here is an NVIDIA Jetson, which is, if you like, the polar opposite to that. This little fella has uh, 256 bytes of RAM. It's about a paragraph of RAM. That's for program space and, 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 and for runtime memory. This guy here has eight maths coprocessors, runs at 2.4 gigahertz, and has uh, two gigabytes of RAM. So that's the, the, the wonderful spectrum of things that we see in the IoT. And it's also quite uh, cheering to talk to NVIDIA, who are sort of calling me to tell, tell me about this great IoT product, their, their Jetson board, and talking about this 20 billion devices, and me gently explaining to them that they probably weren't going to sell 20 billion of those, and that the majority of the IoT devices are probably going to look a little bit more like this. Um, I have done this for real. This is some of my soldering. These are 80 tinies. That's 2.5 millimeters by 1.5. Beautifully soldered. What you can't see is the 30 that I screwed up and had to throw away. Um, <laughs> This is a prototype for the air quality monitoring platform that I'll talk about briefly. And there's another example of my uh, amazing soldering. That's a, a Bluetooth low energy device. And anyone who cares about RF will be weeping inside looking at, <laughs> looking at the way I've connected that. So um, the, um, my, my technology career actually started on the mainframe um, and, and not the IBM mainframe, oddly enough. That was my second job. My first job was working on the Burroughs mainframe back in the time when we were saying, TCP IP, will it take off? Won't it take off? We weren't sure. So they gave me the job of writing part of the TCP IP stack for the Burroughs mainframe because they obviously thought it wouldn't take off and my code would never have to see the light of day. Um, and then about four and a half years ago, I got interested in, in air quality. My, my stepfather is an asthmatic and um, has been very ill for some time. And the, the, the horrible truth about air quality, particularly um, in, 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 in large urban areas like London, in the emerging urban areas, um, um, in, in, in China and India, but also you know, this is very, very much a first world problem as well, is that it's, it's not about an unpleasant smell. It's about a significant shortening of your life. And in some cases, a measurable reduction in IQ for children who go to schools in highly polluted areas. So this is, you know, this is almost an existential problem that we face. And I won't dwell on these, um, 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 and these figures, but, but, but fundamentally, this is a massively costly problem, it's a massively life-changing problem. And attempts that we've made thus far to address it um, have been really quite pitiful. Um, there's obviously that slip up about diesel cars. We're all encouraged to, to buy them, which of course just puts more tiny particles into the atmosphere which uh, eventually get into our bloodstream and kill us. But hey. Um, In London, we have an air quality monitoring network. Um, you may have seen these things here. Uh, they come in various sizes. That's the sort of deluxe or van der Pla air quality monitoring system. That's about half a million pounds. They get smaller and smaller until they're about the size of a typical telecoms cabinet. Those things are about 25,000 pounds. And they measure um, a, an array of different pollutants to very, very high levels of accuracy. Um, unfortunately, there just aren't that many of them. So what we do is we then take a, um, um, a statistical, well, let's call it, should we call it a guess? A guess about what <laughs> the uh, uh, data is uh, like there. And we were talking about this, and, 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 and here are the, here are the, uh, the, uh, the key things that, we, that, that we're interested in. I'm actually not super, academics love ozone. I'm interested in PM 2.5. PM 2.5, that's 2.5 microns. That's particles that are really quite tiny. 
Um, we measure, typically we measure um, um, three sizes. PM10, 10 microns, that's the stuff you can smell. PM2.5, that's the stuff that can get deep into your lungs and give you cancer. And PM1, which is the stuff that gets into your bloodstream and causes uh, cancers from inside your body and not just your lungs. It's awesome stuff. And wouldn't it be great if we could measure it? In London, we measure it in 15 places and then take um, a wild stab um, at, at guessing what the data is going to be like in between them. And it's not, um, it's not just uh, uh, in London, in uh, the United States, um, in New York, for example, um, a tiny, tiny number of sensors out there, and indeed, in the whole of California, there are only 33 sensors in the whole of California measuring 2.5. So this is a, a, a global problem that, that I believe really needs to be addressed. How many of you have sat in a room when someone has uttered the words, how hard can it be? <laughs> Could you put your hands up if you've ever been the idiot who said those words, right? <laughs> Four and a half years ago, I said, how hard can it be? to measure air quality for under, uh, let's say, um, uh, 100 quid. And we go back to, to Yodit's talk. You can measure air quality for under 100 quid, but you may as well go to the fishmongers, buy a fish, and hang it from a lamppost in terms of the quality, <laughs> the data that you get. You can buy ozone sensors for $6, and uh, you, again, you may as well just Put some electrodes on your goldfish. The random data will please you and no doubt will look lovely when flown through Node Red and, and, and presented on a graph, but it's basically random data. So we then sort of went back up the curve, and, and what we were looking for was the lowest cost sensor that would produce data that didn't make academics laugh at us. And it's, we call it the laughter test. And, and I started with the, the, uh, the little MQ sensor series. Those of you who've played will, will know that there's a, a series of sensors that, that, that start MQ. And I went to um, the environmental people at Southampton, and they all went, <coughs> so I, OK. So I went away again and came back and went away and came back. And eventually, we got to a, a, a price point, which is actually about, about £1,000. Um, that's still 250 times less expensive than the big high quality um, air, um, um, air quality monitoring station, still 20 times less expensive than, um, than the small ones. And we believe at that level we can produce data that is really quite close to the data that, um, the, that the high precision ones uh, create. And essentially, the rest of this talk um, is based on lessons that I have learned in the last four and a half years. The number one thing This is the number one thing, guys, and every week we're told it's a new number one thing, but this is the number one thing, and I'm going to scoot through these individually because I'm, I'm hoping to say a couple of faintly provocative things along the way. Security. Is security important? Let's just pause for a second and ask ourselves, is the security important? Um, if you produce something that is insecure, if you produce a, a, a wirelessly connected kettle. Let's pause for a second, okay? This is a device capable of raising water to the temperature of 100 degrees centigrade, and it's okay to switch that on remotely in the train? That's, you know, it was a stupid idea to start with. But secondly, not bothering to think about whether this thing might be secure. Frankly, there should be kind of some kind of law. You know, you should have a developer's license that can be taken away from you for being that <laughs> stupid. This is a bare minimum of competence question. And I can tell you that security costs almost nothing to implement if you design it in from the get-go. It's a little, it's a small incremental cost. But trust me, it's a shitload more expensive to retrofit it six months down the line when you've got to recall your 33 uh, electric kettle, Wi-Fi connected kettles that you sold in California. You could probably walk. They're all probably within a block of you. But, Security, of course, 
it's a massive challenge. Privacy is, 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 is obviously an adjacent challenge. Um, and there are all sorts of very, very complex issues, particularly in the context of the data that we're gathering about human beings. And my definition for what it's worth of the IoT is it's the use of sensors and actuators to monitor and influence the environment, the things within it, and the actors, the, the, uh, the people that, um, uh, that operate within it. And wearable data, um, the fact that my... Uh, <coughs> I live in a, uh, in, in a suburb of Southampton called uh, Totten, which um, is only famous for once being voted the UK's chaviest town. Um, <laughs> and, and every week I get, a, I get a message from Google saying that I am more active than 70% of the local population. And I'm thinking, hmm, <laughs> if I move to Hammersmith, I don't think it'd be so cool. And if I, you know, um, um, I'm just very, very relieved that I live in a very sedentary place. Processor selection is the number one challenge. Um, this is something that irritates me because um, you don't need a supercomputer if you're just sending the temperature to the interwebs. Yeah? Um, this touches on security, by the way. Um, if you're going to deploy Linux machines fundamentally across your network, you're deploying a multi-user operating system that is capable of running all sorts of things, like Telnet, for example. Um, Telnet is something which I, for which I think it should be totally okay to kill someone for implementing, I'd, 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 or at least maim them. Um, um, and developers, developers do this absolutely compulsively. They cannot stop themselves implementing Telnet. It's, I, I, I don't know why. And in fact, no matter how many times you punch them, they still want to do it. Um, um, so so you, ha you, you have to be very, very, very clear about what's going to run. But if you're, if you're just measuring the temperature, why not use a tiny little processor? The big virtue of my tiny little processors is they don't have Telnet. They don't have enough RAM to run Telnet. They certainly don't have a root password. Um, the, um, the likelihood of one of my sensors being used as a springboard for uh, um, attacking a New York casino. The latest news, by the way, is um, um, I think it's 12 gigabytes of data stolen from a casino because someone hacked into the computer that was um, monitoring a fish tank in one of the casinos. Um, Internet of shit um, on Twitter. <laughs> Follow it. It's at Internet of shit. It's, it, is a, it is an absolutely mind-blowing experience. Follow it. Device management. Now, this is an interesting one, because this is a scale thing, yeah? When you're just first developing your IoT network, that's fine. You've only got 12 devices deployed, and if one goes wrong, you can get onto your bicycle and ride out and fix it. So, you know, it's, it's, you don't have to worry about device management. We want to put 10,000 air quality monitoring stations into London. That's an awful lot of bicycle riding. We need to sort our shit out. And one of them is about ma making sure that we can properly manage the device, passivate it, switch it on, switch it off. Um, manage individual sensors, um, um, properly um, understand the environment within which that, uh, that device is operating. One interesting thing about the sensors we're using is that they're very, very sensitive to temperature, humidity, and indeed even atmospheric pressure affects um, um, of the way that they sense. We reckon that if we get 5,000 of these things deployed, we'll know more about the behavior of the sensor than the manufacturer does, because they've never, they've never run a network as big as that. And this comes back to that whole quality of data discussion. And, and how do you watch these sensors to, to, to track how they, they, they drift over time? When do you know when you should replace a sensor? And intrinsic to that device management is to know every single thing about that device. These sensors individually cost sort of between sort of 30 and, and 60 quid a time. We know where every single sensor is in the network. We can, for any given sensor serial number, tell you its whole lifespan of, of, of data readings. Because that's the only way we can understand the physical behavior of these things. So device management, being able to control, and indeed firmware upgrades, and, do, and doing those firmware upgrades in a secure way. And indeed, hopefully in a reliable way. Um, I'm sure none of you um, have had to sit in the darkness while your, your hues Re reboot and, and do their firmware thing, but uh, someone is going to invent a device to put next to the door uh, where, where you press it and the light comes on. It would be fantastic. Um, so, but this is absolutely key to scale, the ability to manage devices. So, for example, and, and again, Yodit was talking about this um, really eloquently earlier, um, again, if you've got 10,000 devices, th th there is going to be a rate of failure. So, um, what you need, actually, is to be able to say to, uh, to someone with an electric car, 
here's your route for today. Here are the 15 devices we need you to collect. The industrial design of those devices means that they should be easy to uninstall and reinstall. So we, we operate, and this is going to sound terribly rude, but we operate a system where we, we talk about people in brown coats and people in lab coats. Brown coats drive around, they take the devices off, put them in a box carefully, take them back to the lab, the white coats then minister to them. We're not going to train an army of people to use oscilloscopes and, 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 and do debugging you know, whilst halfway up a lamppost. What we're going to do is essentially a return to base process. But again, this is about the process of, 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 of managing your estate and managing the devices that exist within it. Integration, the, the, the um, 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 talk that we just had. This is pretty fundamental, actually, because nothing, there's no point to the IoT until we do something as a result of the data. We can, we can admire the wonderfulness of, of, of this data flowing in, but unless some sort of action or change in behaviour is provoked by this data, it's a complete bloody waste of time. So that last mile, getting it from some sort of insight that might be derived from the data, the, 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 the uh, um, um, a, a box of wine has been opened, or the chemo drugs have fallen out of their temperature range, um, a, a lot of chemo drugs... Um, need to be kept within 18 to 25 degrees centigrade. If they go outside that range, their efficacy falls off. Plus, a box of chemo drugs costs about a quarter of a million quid. So, in fact, throwing a $5 sensor in there to, to, uh, to track it's useful. I don't really need to know. I don't need to be constantly tapped on the shoulder and saying, everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. I want to know when something's not okay. So it's how we manage the delivery of that data conversion into some sort of insight, and then the conversion of that data into action. And that's the moment the magic happens. Power management. Um, it's really quite significant here. So if my air quality monitoring station has to be wired into the mains, it adds £200 to the cost of deploying it, because I need someone who's got all sorts of certificates um, to touch mains electricity. If it's just battery and solar, I can take that cost away. So power management actually becomes quite important because it's quite a significant Im impact on the cost associated with deploying and running my network. But um, it's interesting because I first did prototype testing of sensors using some technology from an organisation um, um, that's based in Spain. And they have a fantastic solar solution. Um, absolutely, totally perfect for Spain, where the sun is always shining. It really sucks in England, uh, where the sun very rarely shines, in my experience. Um, the other hilarious thing about these things, okay, it was Libellium, I'll say it, uh, was that they came in waterproof enclosures, which periodically I had to unscrew to let the water out of. Uh, it was waterproof, yeah, the water did not leak out, I don't know how it got in, but once it was in there, honestly, it could have stayed there forever. Um, 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 so just, you know, when you're choosing a supplier, just ask them, what's the weather like where you are? You know, because that might actually make a difference. Um, um, and again, when you're worried about battery and solar, and and this goes back to the device management thing. Um, our optical particle count counter uses 40 milliamps. Some of our electrochemical sensors essentially use a heating coil. They're, they're, you know, they're quite juicy. So we wanted to build um, a regime where we could um, selectively passivate sensors to, to lower the power consumption of, the, of, of, of individual devices and hopefully do it in a matrix so we're not actually losing too much data but the ability then to, to actively manage on a sensor-by-sensor on a, on a -sensor basis the amount of power these things are consuming. Bandwidth. I'm always having this debate. The only thing I know is that Sigfox is a complete failure. Um, <laughs> Sigfox... Sigfox is to the IoT what Minitel is to the internet. It's an ex it is an excruciatingly French technology, and it has many, many things, many, many things to recommend it. France, remember, was, was, you know, was the cradle of the revolution, cradle of the enlightenment, produced Rousseau. Go France, okay? You suck at technology. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I keep having this debate. I keep having this debate. Um, I've just trolled, haven't I? I've just put a troll on stage. Sorry, sorry. Um, um, well, I'm sorry. That is what I feel. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> if you want to know what I think the future of comms is, is do you know we are going to need 3 and 4G and 5G? Um, I'm sending video over LoRa is going to suck a little bit. Okay, so um, um, uh, we're always going to need cellular. Um, I believe that NB, IoT and LoRa will coexist. 
Um, I don't think one is going to, quote, beat the other. Laura has a lot of things going for it. I'm personally, particularly in the context of London and the stuff that we're doing, really keen to use Laura. It's cheap, it's cheerful, it's very easy to deploy. Um, and um, whether it's Virgin Media Broadband or BT, you know, I don't care. Let's get some, 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 some inexpensive Laura um, out there. Um, NBIOT will come, it will be a little bit more costly, but you'll get um, 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 some, some, a, a different set of advantages. The key thing from my perspective is, and this goes to the hardware design of our, of, of our platform, is we, right down at the, the way we've designed the core hardware, we assume there are going to be different comms technologies in use. So essentially, we have a board that, that is capable of being an Ethernet variant, a LoRa variant, a, an exotic strange protocol variant. So for example, we're talking to Philips, some of their smart lighting have adapters that will take sensors. Why not make it easy to plug our stuff directly into that and, 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 and use their network? Architecture. I'm, I'm a bit of an architecture um, um, maniac. I'm, 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 I believe architecture is, is the fundamental way we do agile effectively. It's the fundamental way we, 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 we create um, 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 so, um, software effectively. So there's a certain amount of, of, of opinion here. But essentially, what at the device level, we have essentially three very, very discrete um, stacks which interact with one another through very, very simple uh, and discrete interfaces so that we can change the sensor actuation layer without breaking any of the rest. And this is all done, obviously, through fancy schmancy programming. But essentially, these are discrete sets of classes in the firmware. So that if I find a better way of doing communication, I can just rip that component out, write another one that implements the interface that talks to the controller, and everything is dandy. It's about trying to limit the negative impact of change. And we've done the same on the server side. Um, and on the server side, it's interesting because essentially our server side platform is five entirely independently operating sets of services so that we can replace an individual service using a better, different, even perhaps even, heaven forbid, third party technology um, and without breaking the rest of it. So chunks of our, um, um, and you're all going to have a little titter at this, chunks of our, uh, uh, our platform are still written in PHP. Um, all the stuff that frankly only needs to do a couple of transactions an hour can stay in PHP. Um, we're rewriting most of it in Golang, because... That's actually funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and let me tell you, yes, titters from the boy who, what, five years ago wrote that Linux was ready for the laptop. <laughs> I sent... I left him a voicemail message just of me laughing after I read that. He didn't answer the phone. <laughs> um, um, Golang, Golang is absolutely the future of server-side. Rust is far too brainy. Rust is going to be the future of systems programming. I absolutely believe it. Don't particularly like Rustations, though. Gophers, much, much more fun. The key thing is it's not Node and it's not Ruby. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry about that. It's definitely not Ruby. I mean, it was never Ruby, but um, um, it's definitely not Ruby. Um, but the idea being then that, 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 that components, and if a better language comes along, that's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll replace chunks of it, but these are all sort of collaborating components. Um, and and that's, you know, that is our goal, both, at both ends, you know, whether it's, we don't care what communication mechanism is, that's just another component and a thin piece of software that sits in front of our, um, um, our controller. As CTO, you have to have opinions, and these are my opinions. Frameworks are evil. Um, and let me tell you why frameworks are evil. When you write a Ruby application, you've written a Ruby application. It looks like a Ruby application. It smells like a Ruby application. <laughs> it never looks like a library management application or an ERP system or a, um, um, an IoT platform. It always looks like a Ruby application. Frameworks are for people who are lazy. Write your own framework. End of. 10x developers. What about serverless? There is so much um, AWS. There are big movement of people who move everything over to serverless. Serverless, I'm a huge fan of. And of course, Golang. Serverless, serverless yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the runtime infrastructure 
is a, a topic for another conversation, but, but the, one of the reasons why I'm such a fan of Go is I can run that in super, super thin containers. I can't go full, fully, I can't go lambda because I want to cache stuff and, and, and keep something um, running full time, but happy to have that, that, um, that conversation. But I want to get on to 10x developers. Um, I've worked with 10x developers, you know, the, the gurus. Pain in the ass. I'd, I'd never do it again. I'd never do it again. You get this really clever person who know, you know, instinctively writes JavaScript prototypes and all of that shit. And, and, and then on Wednesday, you get, a, you get a phone call from them and say, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm just too stressed. <laughs> uh, and then on Thursday, I'm sorry, I, I, should, I know I promised I'd do that minor database change, but I saw a butterfly. I mean, no. I, I, what I want is some more or less okay developers. And I want a bunch of them, and I want them to understand what it is they need to do, and I want us to talk about architecture beforehand, and I want them to do it. 10x developers, it's a bloody myth. They, are, they cost you 20 developers. And they're nice to have around, but don't let them actually put anything into production. <laughs> Industrial design. I shit you not, this is the worst thing about the IoT, okay? Anyone watch Star Wars? Hmm, the force is stronger than you. No? Is that... <laughs> no, this is, this is our air quality monitoring uh, um, uh, device. Um, this comes in any colour. Um, so if your building is um, shitty, polluted, Tudor red, you can have a matching, a matching cover. And this is what this is all about. Is it smiling? Is that corner too eggy? I cannot tell you how many hours were spent discussing how eggy that corner was. And I'm thinking, for Christ's sake, I just want something to put my shit in. I don't care how eggy the corner is. But that's what designers do. They drive you nuts worrying about how eggy <laughs> a corner is. <laughs> Public policy and regulation. And this is an important one. And this is something that we all have to be really, really engaged in. Because the people who make the policies They have no idea. They have no idea and they need our help. And ignoring them, which is what my natural instinct, isn't going to help. We need to be pushing ourselves into those committees and onto those meetings. Otherwise, it just becomes a Westminster or regulatory echo chamber. There's another expression I was going to use there, but I'm not going to use it because I, I read the policy about... <laughs> which I've already broken a couple of times, I appreciate, but um, we all need to get involved in this. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something about the digital catapults. Yeah. When I say the word digital catapults, how many of you feel a soaring in your soul? <laughs> Good for you. Now, the digital catapults may have had a rocky start. And I will tell you over a beer why I think that's the case. They now have seen the light. Um, they've also seen the end of their funding. <laughs> the two might be coincidental, but engage with the digital catapults. They are very, very keen to engage with us now. Um, it's a much, much more open... Well, I, I told them, I saw many things. They didn't want to listen, but as I was leaving, I started to notice that the new CEO and then there, there, there's a, a leading lady up there. She used to think that just by data manipulation, she can change the, we are supposed to change the quality of air for her. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that learning to listen thing is something that they've... She sent, she sent a bunch of us in as data scientists, and from our data scientist manipulation of data that is shit, we are supposed to change the quality of air. No, I'm, I'm, Absolutely, and, and, and that goes to Yodit's um, 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 talk. And it's not just that. It's, it's, you know, having done that analysis on hopefully data that is good enough, how do we turn that into some sort of action? And it's, and it's, it, 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 it's the end-to-end -end thing. But they've learned to listen. So engage, please, please do engage with them, because they, they, if we don't, they may not be around much longer. So the absolutely, definitively, number one thing is that the IoT is gnarly. Um, 
It's a lot of things. It's not a single mountain that we have to climb. It's a range of mountains that we have to get the top of. Um, Yodit talked about multi-disciplinary um, 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 teams. You know, this is touching on the design of hardware, the physical design of things. And again, there are all sorts of questions about these things. Why, why do I need three different screwdrivers to disassemble this? That sucks from a manufacturability and a maintenance perspective. It's stupid things like that that we need to think about at, the, at one end of the spectrum and, and at the, the, the other end of the spectrum to, to, to Charlie and, 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 and Andy's talk. None of this means anything until we've actually done something as a consequence of the data we've collected. Thank you very much for your time.